Good morning. One of the neatest things about preaching the gospel and living the gospel in a place like the Silicon Valley is we get to do foreign evangelism on home soil, and it seems like we're working with people from all over the world. Even as I, I look out on this fine group of people here, I see Hispanics and Indians, Taiwanese, and Chinese, Korean, Persian, Filipinos, and some other folks, a bunch of hybrids. <laughs> but a whole bunch of those that would have been regarded as Gentiles by Jews, by Israelites at one point. I was at Tahoe a couple of weeks ago talking with Chuck Durham, who was one of our keynote speakers from Arkansas. And he just asked the question, because we had talked before about the nature of evangelism here, do you convert a lot of Americans? I said, no, we don't convert Americans. We just convert foreigners, <laughs> which was an overstatement, somewhat facetious. But when I think about the people that we work with from all over the world. It's fun, it's challenging, it's neat. And there's this human longing that supersedes culture, language, and other barriers. A need that we all have as human beings to be connected with the God who put us here gave us life and breath and all things, and even the beauty of some of our differences, that we might find commonality amongst those differences, and to be able to assemble, coming from all over the world in a place like this, pray together and sing together and worship God together, which would have been somewhat unique, but it fulfills that prophetic picture of people coming from all nations and streaming into Mount Zion in Isaiah 2. Or Isaiah 9, where you have this picture of predatory animals and, uh, and, and into Isaiah 11, predatory animals and their prey living together in peace. And then the summary statement in verse 9, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Statements made in Isaiah 11, Isaiah 65 and 66, a people from all nations coming into this and, and worshiping together and working together and enjoying the blessings of God together. We begin seeing the inklings of fulfillment of that under Christ in the New Testament when against the backdrop of Jew and Gentile worshiping together, even with great conviction differences about certain things. Romans 14, Paul putting the finishing touches on that discussion in Romans 15 by saying, beginning with verse 5, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. It's a beautiful picture. 
And it's the same picture that Paul paints in Ephesians 2. When he says, beginning with verse 11, Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that at that time, you were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Formerly, you Gentiles, Paul says, were alienated. I believe probably everyone here is a Gentile. I ate, uh, unbeknownst to me at the very beginning of things, walking into this restaurant last night, that it was an Israeli uh, restaurant. And there are some people, by the very nature of the case, that would not set foot in that restaurant because it's an Israel restaurant. But that script was very much flipped in the first century when Peter went to the home of Cornelius, preached the gospel to them, baptized them into Christ. He was accused of going into Gentiles and even eating with Gentiles. And he has to explain that whole situation to them because Jews didn't normally mingle with Gentiles in the first century. And it's hard for us to, to transport our minds back to that hostility that existed in the first century between Jew and Gentile and imagine what it was like to have such a hodgepodge as this sitting on the same pews worshiping God together. That would have been unthinkable to many Jewish Christians even without those Gentiles becoming proselyte Jews and accepting the package deal of circumcision and all of the other things that went with it as badges of Jewish identity, we'll worship together, but only on that basis, not on the basis of something that is brand new and totally different, which is the gospel of Christ. So Paul says in this book of Ephesians that these Gentiles were alienated from the life of God, chapter 4 and verse 18. And he says in chapter 2, verse 12, that they were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. There is this thing between Jew and Gentile, and, and Gentiles to good Jews in the first century were often thought of as dogs, unfit for Jewish polite society. And there was this barrier in the temple of wall that separated the court of the Gentiles from the inner courts of Judaism in which Jews were permitted to, to enter. And that wall had a sign on the outside that indicated that if any Gentile crossed the line to go into those inner courts, he would have his own life to pay for it. When Paul was accused of bringing Greeks into the temple in Acts 21. It was with the idea that violation of temple was the one cause for which Jews could, could put someone to death without Roman authority. And they try to smuggle that charge in against Paul, even though he had not done what they charged him with. And so Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 
describes what you once were, what Christ has done, and what you have now become. And in these first two verses, speaking to Gentile Christians, what you once were, in order to fully appreciate what you now have in Christ, sometimes it's good once in a while to focus on the other side of the tracks. What we did not have, which we now have, to fully appreciate what we have now. What were you anyway as a Gentile before you became a Christian? You were the uncircumcision by those who were called the circumcision, a derogatory name, a label of prejudice and hatred, a label of exclusion. You're not one of us. You're not one of the insiders. And Jews proudly perpetuated this idea. And Paul spent a lifetime trying to flip that switch and undo the harm that was perpetuated by that kind of prejudice, and to promote the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, which undid centuries of, uh, of alienation. And so in Galatians 5, verses 11 and 12, he says, but if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In their case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish that those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. These knife-happy, Judaizing teachers want to put all Gentiles under the knife. And I just wish that they would slip the knife a little bit too far, is essentially what he's saying there. He says back in verse 6, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. It doesn't matter if you are or not. What matters is your faith in Jesus Christ that works through love. You were without Christ. No expectation of a coming Messiah, no promise of a Savior, no hope of all the benefits that come of that messianic expectation of a kingdom with all the glory and the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life that comes with it. Gentiles had no hope of Jesus, as Jews did, at least hope of a Messiah alienated from the life of God, from the commonwealth of Israel, alienated from God's people who were, at least for a period of about 1,500 years, truly one nation under God. God had allowed that temporary arrangement, and it was for the purpose that Israel would be a light to the nations, Exodus 19, 5 and 6. And they did that job relatively poorly for the most part. There are glimpses in which an Elisha influences a Naaman or a Daniel influences a Nebuchadnezzar or a Naomi influences a Ruth. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. There are glimpses of that glory there. But for the most part, the Israelites totally failed in, in that uh, profile, what God intended for them and their destiny. And so what in turn happens is an alienation of the Gentiles, uh, people writing them off, a bunch of immoral pagans who have no part among us as God's chosen people. But it was a temporary arrangement in which they totally failed to live up to that high and noble calling. But God's ultimate intention was to use this as a bridge 
ultimately, which would lead to the coming of the Messiah and the Jesus Christ and all these prophecies kicking into effect, in which the gates are open to everybody, every possible language, ethnicity, cultural background, because God loves all people. And you, you have glimpses of that in, in Jonah in the Old Testament. He didn't want to go preach to Nineveh. He didn't want anything to do with an Assyrian nation that would eventually come and wipe out his own Israelites. And God closes that book with a question, don't you think I love the children over here just like I love Jewish children? He loves all the children of the world. But they were alienated, strangers to the covenants of promise. They did not have the covenant relationship with God enjoyed by Jews during that temporary period. Excluded from the covenant, excluded from the kingdom, excluded from the promises foretold by the prophets, having no hope. Although God had planned and promised to include them one day, they were unaware of it. They had no hope to sustain them. If you have hope, you can endure almost anything. But they had no hope. Without God in the world, literally godless, atheoi, we get our word atheist from that word. As Romans 1 says, they had suppressed the truth they knew and turned instead to idolatry and immorality. And in all likelihood, the ancestors of everybody in this room as Gentiles had a tremendous disadvantage. In Psalm 147, Psalm 147 and verse 20, the Israelites would pride themselves by singing, He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know His statutes or rules. Praise the Lord. Excluded. Godless. But God's intention was always to include them eventually. Paul would say in Romans 3, 1 and 2, what advantage then has the Jew? Much in every way. First of all, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. But these oracles of God communicated through Moses were the Israelites, God's chosen people during that, that period. For the most part, aside from those Naamans and Ruths and others occasionally that you read about, for the most part, Gentiles were utterly lost, godless in the world. So to summarize this, William Hendrickson says that Gentiles were Christless, stateless, friendless, hopeless, and godless. Not a good place to be. And that describes you apart from Jesus Christ, reconnecting you to God. And if you're not a Christian, that describes you now. But Jesus has come to your rescue. What has he done? We've read verses 13 and 14. Verse 15 continues, By abolishing in his flesh the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. So what has Christ done for us anyway? Number one, he brought us near. That applied only to the Israelites in the Old Testament. 
for the most part. Deuteronomy 4, verse 7, For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God whenever we call on him? Gentiles were far off. It was the Jews who were near. And there were metaphors and images used in the Old Testament to describe the, the far-off nature of the Gentiles. Distant coastlands, Isaiah 66, 19. You peoples from afar, Isaiah 49, verse 1. And even Acts 2, 39, for the promise is for you, your children, and all who are afar off. When we were far away, Christ has brought us near, near to the heart of God, and become our peace. The Greek word for peace, arene, corresponds with the Hebrew word for peace, shalom, which is a term of, of self-congratulation on the basis of a covenant relationship with God and all that that implies. It's not just sitting around a negotiating table and getting people who don't agree with one another to just get along and compromise principles so that they could come to the lowest common denominator. The idea of peace in these contexts has specific reference to a covenant relationship and all that peace with God ultimately implies because of that covenant relationship. And Jesus Christ has become our peace. Breaking down the wall of partition. Whatever that wall in the temple symbolized between the court of the Gentiles and those inner courts that were allowed only to Jews, Jesus has essentially broken down that wall so that we can all come in and enjoy fellowship, relationship with God, worship Him together. Materially, although the wall still stood until A.D. 70 when the Romans destroyed it, what the wall symbolized was already broken down in Christ Jesus. He's made both groups into one, one new humanity. No longer Jew nor Gentile. So that Paul could say in Romans chapter or Galatians chapter 3, Beginning with verse 26, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ. Or the apostle Peter could say in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 9 and continuing through verse 10. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. You may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. You were once not a people, but now you are God's people. You had once not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Reconciled both of them into one body so that you have no longer two types of humanity but free access for all regardless of race and ethnicity one body of Christ worshiping together working together singing together praying together he came and he preached peace to those who are far off and those who are near How did he do this? In verses 15 and 16, he abolished the law of commandments contained in ordinances. To abolish is to make ineffective, to make powerless, to nullify. And Christ destroyed the effect of that law of Moses that separated Jew and Gentile by voiding the cause. The effect cannot go away until the root cause is dealt with. 
of what benefit to Gentiles would be the abrogation of Old Testament ritual commands and ceremonies, the covenant-specific rules and regulations that applied to Jews. For starters, it destroyed the distinction of circumcised and uncircumcised. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he says in John 12, 32, that if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And that in a context in which Gentiles are saying, sir, we want to see Jesus. Gentiles. When Jesus died on that cross, the outward ceremonial rituals, the covenant-specific principles that applied only to Israelites that separated Jew and Gentile became null and void. All people can now come into this. So that the end result of all of this is what you are now as opposed to what you once were. Verses 19 through 22. Let's start in verse 18. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God by the Spirit. You're no longer strangers and sojourners. No longer aliens without legal rights, mere refugees. You have a change of status and you're now at home with God and his people. You're citizens of God's kingdom. This is not territorial, political, or nationalistic. The boundaries of God's kingdom are as wide as the heavens. As a Gentile believer, you have new rights and responsibilities that Gentiles could only dream about perhaps before or not even think about. We don't live on a passport uh, on foreign soil. We are at home in the family of God and in the kingdom of God. Members of God's family, more intimate metaphor than kingdom is. God our Father, Christ our elder brother, God's people are brothers and sisters in Christ. And you are building blocks in God's temple. International and worldwide all brought together with a foundation, cornerstone, structure as a whole, with cohesion and growth of the individual stones in their present function and their implied future destiny all packed into three verses. Jesus Christ being the cornerstone of everything. Foundation cannot be tampered with once it lay, it's laid and the superstructure is built upon it. And the New Testament foundation is inviolable. No additions, no subtractions, no modifications. Jesus Christ, his foundation. The cornerstone of unity, growth, and identity. Jesus himself. For the purpose as the dwelling place of God. God dwelling among us and in us, through us. Neither a material building nor a national shrine implied in that. God dwells not in holy buildings, but in holy people. His church all over the world, or people all over the world in one place, perhaps, like this, fitted together. What a beautiful metaphor that is. Have you ever noticed those huge stones in the western wall of the temple that still are there? The Western Wall of what, what was once the temple platform in Jerusalem. One ancient monolith from the southern wall of the temple is 38 feet 9 inches. Gigantic stones. And the glue that holds them together, the mortar that holds them together, is a perfect fit. You don't need the glue or the mortar. You have a perfect fit, one on top of the other, one right next to the other. Built and fitted together 
into a holy dwelling place of God by the Spirit. Which implies not only a present reality, but a future destiny. So you go to a passage like Revelation 21. Then I saw a new nation and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And so as we dwell on these things this morning, don't ever forget what side of the tracks you came from in light of what you have now, incomparable blessings. The grass is really not greener on the other side because of the difference that Jesus Christ of Nazareth makes. And if you will put your faith and trust in him and repent of your nonsense and stand up proudly and unashamedly and confess him before men, be baptized for the forgiveness of every sin you've ever committed, you can be integrated and enjoy all of these blessings that we've talked about. It's the best deal you'll ever receive. And it cost Jesus his blood to make it possible. Think about the blessings and the responsibilities that go with that as we stand and sing a song of encouragement.